What does the future hold for society? In what kind of world do we wish to live? And if we could redesign the way we live, what would it be like? Can the stresses of today be eliminated? Can cities be designed free of traffic problems, pollution, crime, and poverty? Will hunger and disease be things of the past? Sound impossible? When you really start asking these questions and looking for answers with an open mind, you may come to realize it's a lot more possible than you ever imagined. But when governments are self-serving, corporations have turned greedy and neglect the environment, and religion has splintered into countless sects, where do you look? That's the real question and it deserves a real answer. For more than 60 years, Jacques Fresco has been seeking answers to many of today's problems. And for the past 20 years, his associate Roxanne Meadows has been working with him. He's well aware of the issues that continue to threaten our way of life. He has found that most of these problems have common causes. If we deal with the sources, then the problems associated with them will begin to disappear. The two of them built a 25-acre research and design center known as the Venus Project, which is located in Venus, Florida. The Venus Project represents a bold new direction for humanity and explores alternatives and possibilities to improve our way of life. The actual buildings and conference center, along with the models, illustrations, blueprint posters, and video presentation, are the first steps that have been completed to help one see, feel, and touch the future. Over several years, they designed and erected the buildings and put in landscaping, ponds, and lakes. Here, technology and the environment coexist in harmony. They built models of their proposed cities, filmed their videos, and produced their books about the future. Almost everything has been called into question from our dominant values to our crime-ridden, congested cities, from education to the contaminated water we drink and the air we breathe. Many people today attempt to point out the shortcomings and abuses of our social system, but rarely offer positive approaches. What you are about to see is just such an alternative vision of what the future could be if we use the methods of science with human concern. It protects the environment and provides people with all of the necessity that clean technology can provide. In order to accomplish this, the earth and its resources must be declared the common heritage of all people. And all of the artificial boundaries that separate people must give way to a resource-based economy where all goods and services are made available without money, barter, or any means of exchange. The Venus Project offers an optimistic view of humanity's ability to scale new heights for today and tomorrow. This video is about that vision. 
it presents more appropriate ways of dealing with the problems of today. Crime, housing, hunger, unemployment, war, environmental neglect, and human relations, to name just a few. At some point, there has to be new thinking, and that's where Dr. Fresco and the Venus Project and his vision for the future comes in. If I had any criticism of it, it would be that it might be, so far, a little bit on the idealistic side. Mm -hmm. uh, but long term, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the changes that have come about in humanity, thinking just within the, my generation, is remarkable. Mm -hmm. There was a time in this country and elsewhere across the world where communism was the thing of the future and uh, people had great hopes and expectations of the Soviet Union, and they have fallen, mm -hmm. and we can be next. Mm -hmm. And we will be next somewhere along the way unless there are radical changes in the thinking. There's no place to hide today. You cannot escape from human stupidity. War, weapons, corruption seems to be prevalent all over the world. Merely talking about idealism and not designing an approach does not alleviate the problem. Join us on this video journey, and you might just walk away with a few new ideas of your own. We must learn how to listen to new ideas with honesty and objectivity, no matter how different they may sound. Only then will we be able to understand the problems that confront us and deal with them in a more enlightened way. The problems of communication that exist today are not very different from those of the past. When we hear new ideas, we usually don't know how to go about asking questions. We tend to say, well, it'll never fly if it doesn't have any wings, rather than how do you propose to lift off the ground without wings? When someone shows you a new kind of house, you say, well, I don't know that I'd want to live in that kind of house, rather than saying, what are the advantages of this new building? You see, we don't ask those questions. And communication or general semantics would help a great deal. Therefore, when questions are formulated precisely, we can expect answers that are clear and to the point. Through the appropriate use of language, we can establish a better understanding between people. Another major problem in our culture is the displacement of people by automation and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the ability of machines to reproduce the human attributes, such as decision-making, self-correction, and more. If we continue to automate production and get rid of more and more people, pretty soon, if you automate typing and you automate most human jobs, then the majority of Americans and the majority of people all over the world will not have the purchasing power to buy products. For the last 20 years, 43 million jobs have already been lost through automation and other labor-saving devices. Today, job security is a myth. There's no such thing as a lifetime job anymore. Expert systems and artificial intelligence that are being perfected today will eventually replace many professionals, engineers, doctors, and lawyers, to name just a few. Today, most people aren't prepared intellectually or emotionally as to what What's going to happen in the culture in the future and what's even happening today, how fast technology is replacing people. Yes, artificial intelligence will eventually replace doctors, lawyers, engineers, intellect, and be capable of making decisions that humans never dreamed possible by machine. What can we expect in a world that on one hand creates an insatiable appetite for goods and services, while on the other decreases the wages and reduces employment opportunities? What's the answer? It's interesting to note that our capacity to produce goods and services does not appear to be related to money. Today, there is not enough money to solve all of our social problems, but there are certainly more than enough available resources. The Venus Project envisions a solution by implementing a resource-based economy. This uses existing resources rather than money. All resources would be made available to the entire population. A world can be designed for all humankind to live fully and constructively when the powers of science and technology are directed toward human fulfillment and overcoming scarcity. 
This period in history will probably go down as the lowest development because we have the technical potential to wipe out poverty, treat all human illnesses, give research labs whatever they need without ever digging up nickels and dimes or pennies for research. We have all the necessary resources. All that is required is the humane use of science and technology. Have you ever wondered where the first monetary system came from in the first place? It evolved many centuries ago in an age of scarcity and continues to this day as a medium of exchange for resources or labor. In this way, it is necessary for people to work in order to support themselves and their families. The disadvantage about money is that its value is constantly changing. How can a society possibly become stable and secure when the value of its currency is so erratic? Today, money is used to regulate the economy, not for the benefit of the general populace, but for those who control the monetary wealth of nations. The real key to the power of money is in maintaining higher prices through planned obsolescence or an artificial scarcity. Unfortunately, we even destroy food crops to maintain scarcity and higher prices. In other instances, farmers are paid not to grow food while people go hungry. This is sometimes referred to as the conscious withdrawal of efficiency. It is not money that people really need, but freedom of access to the necessities of life. In a resource-based economy, all that would be required are the resources and the manufacturing and distribution of the products. The ideas of a resource-based economy are really similar to the functioning of the human body. See, when you get an infection in your toe, there's no committee meeting that sends a committee to the brain and the brain says, yes, we're going to do a three-month study on that. By that time, your infection's up to your knee. The body has built-in nervous system that immediately supplies antibodies to the infected region. That's exactly what a resource-based economy is. Now then, if you went back to a, a, the free enterprise system or a monetary system, suppose the brain said, look, I do all the thinking. I want most of the oxygen and the nutrients. And then the lungs would say, well, look, if I don't clean the blood and oxygenate it, you couldn't function as a brain. And the brain says, all right, I'll give you enough to survive. Then the liver says, now, wait a while. I'm a filter. I'm important in the function of the body. So all the organs of the human body are well provided for. And this is how it is that we survive. Only the arrangement of human systems is not like that. The Venus Project advocates the application of nature's way to the social system. I like the holistic approach of the Venus Project because it, uh, it looks at how things relate to other things. So much today, uh, we see a problem and we solve that problem and we create another problem. Everything is like a, a lattice, a pattern in a crystal growing and everything relates to everything else. Uh, so many of our failures are based on thinking things are independent. And, uh, and what Jack does is look at the future as a whole and all of the elements of it. A resource-based economy and the linking of computers with automated machines called cybernation could usher in the end of the age of scarcity. Hunger, war, crime, poverty, drugs, planned obsolescence, and the unnecessary suffering in the world today. You know, some of the incentives that we would see in this, in this new society would be the end of poverty, the end of war, the end of territorial disputes, the end of hunger. These are the things that would produce in most people a feeling of fulfillment and would benefit humanity in, in overall. It is neither communistic nor socialistic nor free enterprise. No system remains static. The kings, most of them are gone and newer systems are coming in. No system can freeze and hold their particular position. The primary objective of a resource-based economy is to apply all science and clean technology intelligently to protect the environment and improve the lives of everyone rather than just a selected few. 
fighting for equal rights and equal justice in an unjust system does not produce sufficient changes. We must design and construct a society where equal rights are an integral part of the society and not just a paper proclamation that are subject to individual interpretations. All social systems, regardless of political philosophy, religious beliefs, or social customs, ultimately depend on natural resources, such as clean air and water, arable land, and the necessary technology and personnel to maintain a high standard of living. The real wealth of any nation lies in its developed and potential resources, and the people who are working toward the elimination of scarcity and the providing of a more humane lifestyle for everyone. It works with cleaning the environment, giving people a better lifestyle, making things available to people, so you really change people's, we don't change people's behavior, but people's behavior would change if the environment was different. When goods and services are made available, there would be no limit to the human potential. In a resource-based economy where we have access to all the good things in life, all the things that this bountiful world and appropriate technology can provide without being constrained to obligations to our employer or to the financial system. The upwelling of individual expression would be immeasurable. Everyone would have the freedom to pursue whatever constructive field of endeavor they choose without any of the economic pressures that we face today. This new lifestyle would not just be idle leisure and recreation, but will develop the intellect, health, and the well-being of each individual. The measure of success would be based on the fulfillment of one's personal interests rather than on the acquisition of wealth, property, and power. They'd be so fulfilled in their own lives and what they're doing. And this is the kind of society that we're proposing, a society in which self-fulfillment, not dependency on government, not dependency on your parents or your husband, but a self-growth, self-realization, in which you find a great deal of self-worth and things that you get involved in give you the necessary reinforcement for furthering that general direction. This video has been an introduction to just a few of the aims and visions of the Venus Project. In our next section, The Shape of Tomorrow's Culture, we will take an in-depth look at this new and exciting cybernated civilization. We can now act decisively with a fresh approach to further our evolution and boldly enter the 21st century. Join us in this exploration. The Venus Project introduces a new direction that can make tomorrow's world far better. We can convert the Earth into a second Garden of Eden if we choose to do so, so that everyone can live well. There need not be any poor or hungry. Living in a resource-based economy would present possibilities and opportunities that people would not even dream of today. And what the Venus Project brings is a holistic approach that says to everyone, uh, we can live together in harmony. Technology is a thing that we are going to have to live with. So how do we begin to approach the development of technology, the use of technology, so that there is no environmental damage? So it is designed, in fact, with, with environmental conditions in, in mind, with a balanced load system so that uh, we as humans uh, don't overload any particular resource or, or any part of the Earth that we are looked at as part of the ecosystem itself. Imagine living in cities that actually think. Circular cities elegantly designed and intelligently arranged for the convenience of everyone in them. These cities would be a place where high technology and nature could coexist in a symbiotic relationship.
they will be immersed in lovely gardens featuring lakes and winding streams. The cities would be designed as convenient extensions of human activity, free of noise, crime, and pollution. The Venus Project looks very much at what the environmental requirements are to live on this Earth. It's not technology uh, as a thing opposed to uh, the Earth and the environment, but how can our technology live in harmony with the Earth? The city's outer perimeter will provide recreational facilities, such as golfing, bike paths, riding, and hiking trails. There will be a circulating waterway surrounding a highly productive agricultural belt. The water will contain indigenous plants that will remove many harmful materials. The transparent and closed buildings in the agricultural belt will be used to grow a wide variety of plants in a controlled environment without the use of pesticides. Wind turbines, photovoltaic cells, solar heat concentrators, and other clean, renewable sources of energy will be used. In the residential district, one may choose to live in individual houses or apartments. These apartment towers will offer many additional advantages, such as conference centers, gymnasiums, art facilities, and theater groups, to name just a few. Some of the buildings will be free-form and curvilinear, while others may be domed or cylindrical in shape. The apartments can be designed with great flexibility and a wide range of interior styling. They will be made of high-quality, prefabricated modular units. This way, the occupants can easily change the interiors when desired. The outer surface of all the buildings will be solar activated, so the higher the outside temperature, the cooler the inside. The residential area, beautifully landscaped amid lakes and winding streams, displays a wide variety of innovative designs. These homes are contoured to blend in with the environment. They are prefabricated with new materials requiring little maintenance. With this type of construction, damage from earthquakes, hurricanes and fire would be greatly reduced. To reduce travel time, recreational areas will be conveniently located throughout the city. For transportation, horizontal, vertical, and radial conveyors will move people about safely and conveniently. We would tend to eliminate auto vehicles or any kind of vehicles in the city itself. There are conveyors, elevators, vertical, horizontal transport systems that move like moving sidewalks, some are covered, and the transportation system is all worked out to take you any place in that city except emergency vehicles. There are emergency vehicles that can be brought to any particular area of that city in case of injury or medical needs. The larger building complexes that surround the central dome house the design, planning, and research centers. The eight domes surrounding the central dome will be used for art, music, theater, exhibition, entertainment, and conference centers. The central dome will house education, health care, shopping, child care, and the core of the cybernated system. This cybernated system will be the computerized communications and networking system. 
Cybernation is the linking of computers with automated machines and new technologies. This cybernated complex will display a 3D projection of the entire planet in real time so that people may access planet-related information such as weather, locations of ships and planes, and other features. This information will also be available in all homes, research facilities, and recreation areas. And that's what the Venus Project is all about. It looks at all the ramifications of this technological society and how wonderful things could be once we take it as a systems approach. Central Cybernation will serve as the brain and nervous system of the city. Its electrical tentacles will extend into all areas of the social complex. It could coordinate all of the functions of the entire city, our nation, and eventually the world. This cybernated system could eventually bring an end to the age of politics. When you talk about centralized control, you're not talking about centralized control of the actions of people. You're talking about centralization of information that will enhance the lives of people, will enhance the state of the world, the environment. You're talking about input from data gathering equipment orbiting the planet beneath the seas, all over the land, that will give us a constant input of relevant information that we can use to continue into the future, continue a sustain sustainable society, and work toward the betterment of the whole human family. For example, in the agricultural belt, the computers will automatically monitor and maintain the water table, soil chemistry, and coordinate the planting and harvesting of crops. Eventually, with the use of automatic inventory, materials will be supplied to the manufacturing plants throughout the nation. In this way, a balanced load economy can be maintained, eliminating shortages and overruns. Only when cybernation is integrated into all aspects of this new and dynamic culture can computers appropriately serve the needs of all people. Today, people feel threatened by the development of cybernation and artificial intelligence, and they are correct in feeling this way. The threat of losing one's job and income is very real in a monetary-based society where downsizing is profitable. Only in a resource-based economy, as proposed by the Venus Project, would new technologies be used to shorten the workday while raising the standard of living for everyone. Some people uh, worry that the emphasis on technology in the Venus Project is too materialistic, that uh, it focuses too much on machines. Um, and that would be true, except that the Venus Project focuses even more on humans and the, the growth and the potential that humans have that is not currently being met by our, our, by our system. Uh, the project focuses on taking people out of doing day-to-day uh, -day, uh, repetitive tasks and uh, giving them the freedom to explore those parts of themselves uh, that are very dear to their hearts, that, that money and making a living uh, doesn't allow them to do. I'm not too interested in technology, although it may seem that I advocate that. In actuality, all the wonders of technology to me are just so much junk, unless it makes humans better. So technology and the Venus Project in science is not the primary idea. Those are just the tools that are used for people to have a, a, a more complete life. In this system, cybernation and technology will only serve to enhance people's lives. They would not be used to monitor or dictate people's activities. This would be considered counterproductive and offensive. No one's going to come along and say, I'll make the decision for you. Centralized decisions come from control of scarce resources. I uh, go to work at a certain time because my boss says I have to, and if I don't, I don't get paid. But in 
the Venus Project's idea of a common heritage of resources. None of us own any of the resources. We own all of them in common. And so the decision for how we will live our lives becomes an individual choice. Society will continue to undergo change regardless of the dominant views of the time. Our future does not depend on our present day beliefs or social customs, but will continue to evolve as a set of values that is appropriate to that point in time. In the dynamic expanding universe, all things change from the movement of the planets to the shifting of the continents. The same process of change also occurs in all non-living and living systems. In fact, the history of civilization is the story of change, from the simple to the more complex. Unfortunately, change does not always come easily. All new inventions and innovative ideas have always been met with considerable resistance, even by the experts of the times. This includes automotive systems, aircraft, and the space program. Some of the conditions responsible for social change are limited resources, overpopulation, epidemics, natural disasters, and the technological displacement of people by machines. Change does not always occur for the better, but it is a process that occurs regardless of the dominant values of the times. Even social systems undergo change. Therefore, the only constant is change. Today, with the advent of computers, World Wide Web, cybernation, and artificial intelligence, the rate of change has been greatly accelerated throughout the world. And in the next 10 years, we will witness more changes than all of the past events in recorded history. Perhaps one of the greatest limiting factors of our present day culture can be traced to our language, habits, social customs, and values, which were conceived in earlier times and are no longer relevant. The proposals of the Venus Project will also be applied to education, where the subjects studied will be relevant to the direction and needs of this new, evolving culture. I would say the more we invest in human beings, in warmth, love, education, good fellowship, the more secure all our futures. We are tied in with nature, and all of the environment surrounding us. To negate or neglect any part of that would be damaging to ourselves and our own age. Although books and computers will be used in the schools of the future, most of the educational processes will be of a participatory nature in which students will interact directly with the physical environment. They will learn by doing in a hands-on approach which will provide them with a better understanding of the world they live in. They will come to understand that the Earth is a fantastic place capable of providing more than enough for the needs of everyone. And as the technology takes over the day-to-day -day drudgery, we have more time to in fact make those decisions, more time to spend with our children, more resources to teach them and give them the experiences we want them to have. It opens up possibilities that within the infrastructures that we operate now, uh, we as individuals uh, can't, do, can't do. But perhaps the most important aspect of the educational approach will be the emphasis on learning how to interact effectively with others, how to share experiences, and how to allow for cultural and individual differences. This will reduce conflicts considerably and contribute to a more humane society. The problems that confront humanity today are of our own making. Our future is our responsibility and depends solely on the decisions we make today. How come people are unemployed? How come people live in the street? And how come people need medical care and can't get it? And I know we have the technology 
If we can put a man on the moon, maintain a war, maintain all this military equipment, we need a pentagon of sanity, people who care about the Earth and all other human beings. In the next section, Visions of the Future, we will continue to present attainable alternatives. We will explore clean, renewable energy systems, transportation, and architecture. You'll see how space stations and cities in the sea could open new dimensions in human achievements in the 21st century. The problems we face in the near future will be unlike anything we have ever confronted in the past and will require vastly different and new strategies for solving them. Eventually, we will learn how to tap the greatest limitless resource available, the human mind. It is unfortunate that we direct our finest minds and resources to build whatever is needed only in times of war. If this same effort, time, and personnel were organized for reclaiming the environment and improving housing, health care and education, and the overall standard of living for all, the world would be a better place. Through research and development, we could create a world where war and want will be but a distant memory. Only then will the spirit of humanity soar and accomplish its full and wonderful potential. When all of science and technology is used intelligently for the protection of the environment and all of humankind, the world will be a much different and far better place. Most people today have a fear of automation or artificial intelligence. They feel that it'll make people more like machines than human beings. Actually, this is not the case, because everybody has a refrigerator, hi-fi set, and machines were never a threat to people. Machines not having emotions, they have no ambition. They don't want to run things. They don't want to control people. It's the abuse and misuse of machines that we have to concern ourselves with. The world as we know it could be rebuilt, and the reconstruction begins with great machines. They will instantaneously link all of the nations of the world, emphasizing the human side and what we have in common, rather than the differences. This would not be a sterile and ordered lifestyle. In order for humanity to grow, life must offer humankind more than simple comfort and enough to eat. People must be provided with new challenges and a direction to work towards. It is now possible to accept this challenge of designing our future if we have the courage to examine newer directions for solving our problems of energy, hunger, pollution, and war. It is entirely possible to develop non-polluting, renewable energy systems to operate the entire country and still maintain our natural surroundings. This could be accomplished by harnessing the sun, the tides, the wind, the Gulf Stream, and other sources. Another possible development is the building of a land bridge or dam across the Bering Strait, which would bridge Asia and Europe with the U.S. This could generate enough power to eliminate much of the suffering and scarcity of the third world countries. Eventually, with the advent of clean fusion power, we could easily propel our world's technology for the next thousand years. In the Venus Project, priority will be given to the development of these clean energy sources. There are many other possibilities for developing photovoltaic systems that generate electricity, while at the same time harness the currently unused radiant heat energy from the sun. Roadways, rooftops, and many other surfaces could be designed to collect and store the heat from radiant energy, which could be used for heating or cooling. Transportation will also be safer, more efficient, and environmentally clean. Eventually, all of the world's transportation systems will be interlinked. 
these electrically operated, streamlined cars will provide high speed, energy efficient and safe transportation. Some will have wheels, while others will use magnetic levitation or air flotation. Most vehicles will be operated by voice command that will allow the passengers to determine their destination simply by requesting it. The vehicles will be silent and periodically transport themselves to service and maintenance facilities. While these high-speed maglev passenger trains are in motion, a segment of the passenger compartment can be released. These removable sections can then take passengers to their local destinations, while other compartments are lowered in their place. In some instances, the rear section of a train can be disengaged and rerouted to other destinations. This method allows the main body of the train to remain in motion thus conserving energy and time. In addition, the removable compartments could be specially equipped to serve many transportation purposes. The bridges of the future will be constructed of new materials that are lightweight, durable, and of great strength. Their simplified lines will be a direct expression of the stresses and forces they are to support. If we had more people who are using their creative talents appropriately to think about the problems that we all know that are there but we do not have the time to work on or to, to, to collaborate together to do something about, uh, then we're going to continue on this path. If we move in the direction of the Venus Project, uh, where we'll be working together creatively, working in the problems that are confronting uh, the human condition. I think that this is the, uh, the most viable approach that we can take in the future to solve our problems. Oceans and waterways will serve as an important link in the transportation system. Streamlined seafaring ships will have flotation chambers rendering them practically unsinkable. They will be manufactured from durable composite materials and require minimal maintenance. Some will float on the water, while others will be designed as submersible or amphibious craft. Ships that are floating automation plants will pick up raw materials and process them into a finished product while en route to their destination. Some of these ships will serve as canneries and fish processing plants, while others will be equipped with multicellular, flexible containers to transport materials safely. This way, in the event of an accident at sea, environmental contamination would be reduced to a minimum. All the craft will be self-maintaining and fully automated. Some of these aircraft will be able to carry as many as a thousand passengers. They can be controlled by electrodynamic methods that will not require ailerons, elevators, rudders, spoilers, flaps, or any other mechanical controls. This electrostatic means of control will also repel ice and snow from the surface of the craft. This same process could even be used for reducing heating as spacecraft re-enter the atmosphere. This would eliminate the need for the heat-resisting tiles used on the shuttles today. This VTOL aircraft of Delta configuration would be capable of vertical landing and takeoff making it useful for medical, emergency, and transportation aircraft. Airports of the future can also be more efficient. Underground conveyors will transport passengers to the central terminal. The runways will be designed so that aircraft always take off and land into the prevailing winds avoiding dangerous crosswind landings. 
all of the runways would be equipped with sprinkler systems that are automatically activated in the event of a fire. The world's oceans occupy approximately three quarters of the Earth's surface. And beneath the surface lie vast, untapped resources, large quantities of food, minerals, pharmaceuticals, metals, and much, much more. Massive ocean structures proposed by the Venus Project would be both above and beneath the sea, accessible by aircraft, sea craft, and submersibles. These cities of the sea are designed to accommodate from 2,000 to 30,000 people. Several thousand of these cities could greatly relieve the land-based population pressures. I don't care for the idea of machines being used to enhance the lives of a selected few. They can serve the well-being of all people. And this is what the Venus Project's main concern is. Not machinery, not cybernation, not automation, but to elevate all human beings to their highest intellectual and physical potential and sense of spiritual well-being. Some of these cities in the sea will be used for fish farming and mariculture communities and could easily help feed the world's hungry. Wind generators, upwelling, tidal, solar, and harnessing the Gulf Stream will help supply the energy to operate these cities. These cities in the sea will offer most of the amenities that land-based cities have and much more. Here, one can enjoy all of the exciting mystique and recreational features of the oceans. On these sea cities, gardens provide serene and picturesque environments. People will dine on the terrace in the privacy of lovely gardens, where all of the rooms have a spectacular view of the ocean. These facilities are also part of the universities for the study of marine sciences, meteorology, mariculture, ocean mining, geology, oceanography, and more. Many of these cities in the sea will serve as underwater international parks, where visitors can observe the great underwater reefs of the undersea wonderland. From a computerized chair, Communication with dolphins and many other forms of sea life will be possible. The proposals of the Venus Project range from cities in the sea to space stations. These cybernated space stations can provide the facilities of a gravity-free research environment. They can be entirely automated and will be capable of maintenance and self-repair. Along with satellites, they could serve as nodes in a major worldwide telecommunications and control system. They would also provide up-to-the-minute information on Earth's ecosystems, the position of ships and aircraft, and all other pertinent information. They will also be able to pilot and guide aircraft, ships, and other transportation systems to their destinations. They will differ from today's space stations in that all of the experiments in space will be conducted by remote control from a replica on Earth. This will eliminate the life-threatening danger of transporting humans into space. These satellites can also, with great precision, manipulate huge machines on Earth which will dig canals, operate automated farming, plant crops, manage sea farms, monitor weather conditions, and much more. Further exploration of the new frontiers of the ocean and space will provide us with bountiful resources and endless possibilities. The agriculture of tomorrow will also undergo considerable changes. Agriculture will be completely computer-controlled and monitored by electronic sensors. 
No longer will farming be subject to drought, insects, and weather conditions because most of it will be computer monitored and much of it enclosed. Eventually, the polar regions may be used to store grains and other perishables for international emergencies. Before any of these mega projects are started, careful analysis of the possible negative effects on the environment will be thoroughly studied. We cannot freeze things as they are today and achieve peace on Earth. We can't legislate peace by treaties within today's society when few countries control most of the world's resources. In a resource-based economy, when all of the Earth's resources become the common heritage of all of the Earth's people, then and only then will we witness an end to territorial disputes, nationalism, war, poverty, and most crimes. It is difficult for us today to even imagine a world without war, anger, poverty, wage slaves, prisons, or social stratification of any kind. Yet a world can be designed for all humankind to live as fully and as constructively when the powers of science and technology are directed toward human fulfillment. This can only occur when society is unhampered by the limitations of the old monetary system. People will eventually learn to set aside self-centered egotism and racial hatred and surrender their ego for constructive, cooperative behavior. Many people wonder whether or not human nature can be changed. It's really not human nature that we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is behavior. And there certainly is plenty of evidence to show that human behavior can be changed. And it has always undergone change. Humans pick up from their environment customs, values, language, dialect, which is all environmentally determined. If you alter the environment, so does behavior undergo considerable change. At present, our planet is our only sustainable environment, and we must protect it for ourselves and generations to come. The technology and resources are available today to translate the aims of the Venus Project into a working reality. Well, I wanted to say there's no such thing as utopia. What you call the best television set is the best that you have up to now. But you know, two years from now, you'll look back and say, oh my God, see? So what you call utopia is just a better way of life than you've known in the past. But there's no end to, to the possibilities, which I think haven't even begun yet. The civilized world hasn't even begun to get off the ground. The jobs that will be accomplished in the future, the marvels, the technology to come is unbelievable. And it's about high time we get off our self-centered, self-seeking, self-advantageous designs and get on with the social job that has to be done, namely the reclamation of the environment and human beings as well. So we welcome everybody's participation. We can now act decisively with a fresh approach to further our evolution and boldly enter the 21st century. We welcome your inquiry, careful analysis, and participation to build a civilization truly worthy of humankind. The quality of life in the future will ultimately depend on the choices we make today. To become involved, contact The Venus Project. Our address, The Venus Project, 21 Valley Lane, Venus, Florida, 33960, USA. One of the things that The Venus Project talks about is allowing people the potential, uh, the ability to explore all of the, the facets of their personality. Instead of making us humans doing, we become humans being. We want to explore uh, relationships. The emphasis is on how do we relate to one another as humans? How do we relate to the earth in a healthier, um, better way? And there is room for all thoughts and all processes, um, all 
all religions and all philosophies. It's a, it's a, it's a process of coming together uh, as a community, as a global community.